good evening. Thank you, uh, Dean Lee, for that kind introduction. Um, it's an honor to share a room with so many people who believe, as I do, that the best should teach, especially because so many of the best are actually in this room. Congratulations to all the award winners. Um, it was quite humbling to hear about your accomplishments, and it is, it is hard work. So I think, I often think, gosh, no one really understands what, what these folks are up against every day, and it's incredible. So um, congratulations. Um, I'm thrilled to be at Boulder um, because this university takes social justice seriously. You work toward it in the School of Education and the graduate teaching program, and your undergrads push for it in the College of Arts and Science. There are lots of folks in this room who'd identify as change makers, and I like that. As no doubt you all know, um, next week our nation will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's uh, March on Washington. On August 28, 1963, Dr. King um, spoke to some 250,000 people as he shared his I Have a Dream speech. As I reflect on where we were 50 years ago in the pursuit of equity and justice in our nation, I am proud of the progress our nation has made. We have come a long way. At the same time, inequity in our nation has a stronghold on our education system, a system deemed to be America's greatest equalizer. The words of Dr. King a half a century ago still ring true today. 50 years ago, he said, we refuse to believe that this bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the vaults of opportunity in our nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us the riches of freedoms upon demand and the security of justice. We also come to this hollowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tra tranquilizing drug of gradualism. I learned the true meaning of the fierce urgency of now when I taught first and second grade bilingual in South Phoenix, Arizona. During my three years in the classroom, I learned what it would take to give my students the richest of freedoms as they grew. It's why I do what I do today. So I'm grateful that you've invited me here today, but I'm even more grateful for the work that you do each day. You are change makers, providing the vaults of opportunity for all of our kids in this nation. And that's what I'd like to talk about this evening. To me, this issue is personal. I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. If you get to the Mexican border and hit, go about 15 miles north, you'll run into McAllen, which is what you'll run into McAllen, which is where I call home. My mother came to the United States from Mexico at the age of 17 with a formal eighth grade education. And she refused to marry my father until he completed his college degree. It's a true story. Um, he was a firefighter by night and he was going th to school during the day and he was tired and supporting his mom and my, my mom knew that it was important for him to complete his college degree to provide the kind of life sh she wanted for her kids. It's all worked out because they're still together 40 years later and it's all worked out for all of us. Um, so my parents knew that education is everything. My mother pushed me, my two sisters, my brother, and my teachers every day. They instilled in us the importance of going to college. So it's not surprising that upon graduating from college, three of us became teachers. My sister Elaine is, a special, is taught special education for 16 years at Nimitz Middle School in San Antonio and is now a special education coordinator at the local high school. And my younger sister, Monica, um, has taught for nine years in the Rio Grande Valley. We all entered the classroom in different ways. Elaine went to Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio and got trained through the School of Education. I joined Teach for America and was certified while participating. 
And my youngest sister, Monica, was alternatively certified through a local program in the Rio Grande Valley. Though we arrived at teaching differently, we agree on this. Teaching is a privilege, and all children deserve the best teachers. Their futures and ours depends on attracting and keeping more exceptional educators in our schools. I know that's what you believe too. You're here today because you know that a quality education can be the difference in having agency, <coughs> empowerment, and choices in life, and not. And it's something my organization, Teach for America, believes deeply. In fact, our belief is all children deserve an excellent education. No matter your race, no matter your background, you deserve an excellent school. For the last 23 years, we've worked hard to bring dedicated college graduates into underserved schools. We look for leaders to train as educators, guide through their certification process, and support them in their classrooms. We are selective because, like you, we believe this profession needs deeply committed individuals, and our children deserve to have teachers who are going to have the highest of expectations and work tirelessly for them each day. Our teachers come from diverse backgrounds. Some are veterans from the armed forces seeking their next mission. Some are education are coming from schools of education eager to see to serve our nation's lowest income communities. Many of them come from the same neighborhoods and backgrounds as the students they teach. 38% of our teachers are people of color and 23% are first generation college graduates. All have proven leadership and academic skills in college or in their graduate school careers. We are proud to give many exceptional people a path to teach students who need the most. A path they might not otherwise have chosen or considered. In fact, only 15% of our core members considered a teaching career prior to joining to, uh, Teach for America, and two-thirds of, out, out of our 32,000 alumni remain in education. <coughs> TFA gives talented people a path to the classroom and helps give them tools to succeed like you all do. We believe that our nation's schools should embrace all great teachers, no matter where they come from. Once in the classroom, we are in this together. In the day-to-day, -day, each pathway to the profession is inextricably linked. In the end, excellent teachers from education schools, Teach for America, or local education programs end up working side-by-side -side toward a common goal, to create empowered citizens with agency who contribute to their communities. But I will be honest and say that I've spent a good portion of the last year on the road traveling, listening to teachers and leaders in this space and in this field. And our national conversation about education is more polarized and political than I've ever seen it. It pits teachers against teachers, parents against teachers, teachers against principals, principals against legislators. We're picking sides and throwing punches, and it's not working. Our students get overlooked. That's why it's crucial that everyone who cares about kids comes together, because we face a big problem in our country, and we can't solve it unless teachers decide to unify against it. Gaps start early, and they grow over time. It is unbelievable to me that by fourth grade, 80% of Latino and black kids are reading below the proficiency level. It's un-American, and it is why we need change now. It's unacceptable that half of the 1.3 million students that drop out of high school every year are low-income children of color. Instead of being the great equalizer it was intended to be, today, our education system perpetuates inequity. Americans enjoy less economic and social mobility than citizens of every other developed country. Statewide, here in Colorado, 
Less than 60% of Black, Latino, and American Indian eighth graders passed their state English tests, compared to nearly 83% of their white peers. In science, with our nation that prioritize, prioritizes STEM initiatives, the state had 63% of white and Asian students pass their tests, while just under 30% of black and Latino students saw the same result. This is not unique to Colorado. Gaps like this exist nationwide. All children need to get the STEM education they deserve. Are test scores everything? Absolutely not. But they provide data that we can learn from. The bottom line is kids are not getting an equal education and that is not right. At a time when a college degree is basically a prerequisite for financial security, just 8% of low-income kids graduate from college, compared to 80% of students from top income brackets by the age of 24. <coughs> it's why our profession is a lot more than a daily lesson plan. It's about lives, lifetimes of change in our world. It's why we need change makers like you. The late Dr. Stiles, who established this very event, was a passionate advocate for teachers and for educational equity. He was instrumental in the Supreme Court's landmark Brown versus Board decision in 1954, which struck down separate but equal education. What would he say today if he heard that our schools are as segregated and unequal as when that decision came down? He recognized that educators are at the helm of things, of changing things, and he'd want us to keep at it. The stakes are high for us to waste any time fighting with each other. In the face of a crisis that threatens our economic and civic strength and our ideals as a nation, we have to overcome our differences and pull together, or we will fail together. As educators, we have to find the courage and compassion to work as one, to face the hard truth of what's not working, to embrace the solutions that are, no matter where they come from. Teachers certainly did not create this problem, but we are indispensable to solving it. That's why I believe that teachers must lead the charge to dramatic change in education. Our elected officials should enlist you as partners in this fight to ensure educational equity for all. You are the ones in front of kids every day. You know what questions to ask, you know whether a curriculum is working, and you know what policies you need to be at your best. You know what kids are capable of, you know what excellence looks like. You are professionals, and this should be valued. Our voices now more than ever must be heard because no one can be satisfied with the status quo in which the zip code of where a child is born is the strongest indicator of her future prospects. It's our responsibility to spread the changes that give children a chance to claim the vaults of opportunities Dr. King promised. Those changes start with change in dialogue. New teachers and the veterans on those shoulders they stand, principals, administrators, professors, leaders at schools of education and others. We must sit at the table with our students next to us, no matter how much our opinions differ. We must listen to what they say and make the changes they need now. I welcome tough questions during our Q&A. I never deny that there are legitimate disagreements, and I believe that if we don't start addressing them, we'll never move forward, and we can't collaborate and have on until we start to have honest discourse. Many groups and individuals are working in different ways to make schools better, to show a different normal. We need to embrace what is working and stop doing what is not working. At Teach for America, we believe that we are one part of the solution amongst many. This year, we'll have nearly 11,000 core members, which is what we call our teachers, teaching across 48 communities and reaching over 750,000 students in urban and rural public schools. 
Our alumni force is 32,000 and growing. I'm incredibly proud of the two-thirds of our alums who remain in education, but I'm also proud of the ones who decide to take on new roles. Our alumni work for change as social entrepreneurs, policymakers, doctors, and in many other fields. This is important too. We need systemic change. We need passionate, informed folks fighting for students at all levels of the system, both inside and outside of education. Let me give you an example. So right here in the Centennial State, um, Damien Lee Natale was born and he was raised and um, he went to public schools. He later taught through Teach for America and he wanted to give back to the community where he gave, grew up and that was important to him. So in the classroom, Damien got fed up with his school's lack of funding. He was tired of his kids not getting the basic resources that they needed to learn. Damien took action. He wanted to teach forever, but he wanted to fix funding first. Damien enrolled in law school here at CU Boulder. He learned to turn his frustration into legislative action. Today, he is Colorado State Senator's Senator Michael Johnston's Chief of Staff, who is also a Teach for America alumni. Um, Senator Johnson was part of the 1997 uh, Mississippi Delta Corps. In the Senator's office, he's currently fighting to make, sure, to make sure schools have the funding they need as part of the state's finance overhaul. With the help of CU Boulder faculty, Damien and his team came up with a plan to increase funding for English language learners the kind of students I taught tenfold. It's already passed in the State Senate in the House and has been signed by the governor. If voters approve this bill in the fall, Damien plans to go back to the classroom. Damien, his fellow alumni and core members, his peers at CU, they are all part of the solution. To transform the U.S. education system, we all need to change. We all must be asking these same kinds of questions. So no matter what your role, if you're a professor, a graduate student, a local teacher, or an undergrad looking to figure out what to do next, make schools your priority. If you're an elected official or a business person or a social worker, make equity your goal. And make education the equalizer it was intended to be. Don't settle for an action. However you do it, push for a world where every child gets the best education they deserve. As we join together for change, I ask us to do this with a fierce urgency of now and avoid the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Change begins with our students, their families, and each of us. Our country has never needed us more. Thank you. So I'm hoping people have questions or comments. Um, and if not, we can get to the reception and go, I think, have food, um, which is great, too. And I'll, I'll be hanging around for a while. But would love to, I don't know, hear what's on your mind. Sure. There's a mic right there. Great. Simple, basic, complicated, and hard. We love them all. I love them all. Yes. How many CU Boulder students do you have here? each year? I don't, but we have a recruitment team here who can answer that question. Every year. Yeah. Approximately. Which is great. It's good presence for us. Yes, sir. No. Maybe you can use a teacher voice. 
Can you introduce yourself just so we know? Yep. I have enormous respect for your personal story as you described it. I can't pretend to that kind of struggle. My parents were members of the labor union, as am I, and also part of Dr. King's like secret for support for the labor union. Rather than go into long side private, just no secret, and part of, I'm sure, part of the many conversations Relations are frayed between Teach for America and Teachers Union. I'm genuinely curious in whether you're comfortable with that, how you see that mm -hmm. progressing, but how do you respond to, to that? Yeah. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. No. no. Okay. So the question is. Um, Teacher unions and labor unions are an important legacy in our country, um, which I would fully agree with. Um, and, uh, and it is no secret that there are frayed relationships between Teach for America and unions. Um, and the question is, what's my perspective on that and am I comfortable with that? Um, so what I would say is, you know, there's no skirting around the issue in that there are some philosophical differences um, with at least the teacher unions, which some of us, you know, which is where I focus my time and attention. But at the same time, what I would say is I, the, the union conversation I think is actually a community by community one. We have a great relationship with Randy Weingarten um, with the AFT. I mean, we actually work and have actual relationships and try to figure out what common ground we do have as part of my listening tour. So when I took on this job, Five months ago, the first thing that me and my co-CEO, Matt Kramer, did is I've been with TFA and on the senior team for 12 years. Um, well, I've been with TFA 12 years, eight years on the senior team, and Matt also has been on the team for eight years. And we decided, you know what, the first order of business needs to be to like step back and go out and just listen to people. And go listen to the Friends of Teach for America um, and, and people that are in our community, meaning our core members and our alumni and our funders and supporters, um, but also you know some critical friends. And so we actually met with union folks in Detroit and New York and other places where we went. Um, and, and I think that's important to do because I think at the end of the day, it's about our kids and I believe that people in unions agree with that and say absolutely, obviously, we're all about children. Um, I do believe that there are some practices that are difficult and are um, and policies that make it difficult to have the kind of change and innovation that I personally believe is absolutely necessary if we're going to make progress because it is not working as it is for our kids. And it's and it's and I, I personally feel like that's sort of that's undeniable that our our system currently as is. It, I don't believe that unions should not exist. I don't believe that, but I believe we've got to find common ground. And I and you see and I see great negotiations happening across many communities in Washington D.C. Um, when the teacher contract was passed, there was lots of innovation and um, and I think lots of common ground and, and pushes on all sides that were made. I see that happening in Colorado, frankly, uh, with the legislations that are being considered that, you know, I think there's a role for everybody, but rather than pointing fingers, and I think this is a flaw of education reformers where, you know, there are lots of pointing fingers and if unions would just disappear, all the problems would be solved and I don't believe that. Um, I believe that we've got to figure out how to work together because the fighting and the, and the polarization is destroying us, frankly, and it's harming no one more than our children every day. Thank you for your question. Other questions? <laughs> I give up. Other questions? I, I love the talk a lot. It, it was very inspirational, and, and I, I really appreciate how much you did to connect your remarks to our situation here in Colorado, and, and particularly the work of Dr. Stiles. That, that, was, that was wonderful, because he did have that pivotal role in yes. a pivotal moment, 
and, and, and we need to keep that in mind. I, I have not, it's not a tough question, it's an impossible question for right. me. Um, <laughs> you talk several times about polarization. Yeah. I said to a, this was probably quite stupid because the person I was talking to was a reporter, but I, I said to him the other day, I, I said it, it feels sometimes like this country is involved in a non-shooting civil war. Mm. That the polarization seems that bad. Yeah. And the polarization seems in some ways to be centered on questions of knowledge and education, writ large. That there are people who refuse to be educated. I'm not talking about the children now, obviously. I'm, I'm talking about the, the whole population. Um, how are we, I, I, sitting where you're sitting, how, how do we get past this, this moment? Well, um, I think we need to stop blaming each other and people. Like, I just think, I don't know. I think it's, a, it's really hard for us to look in the mirror. I think it's the hardest thing for us to frankly look in the mirror and say, this is bad, <laughs> this is not working. And that requires me to change, it requires the thing to change that I'm comfortable with or used to. And change is hard and we're human beings and that is scary and that is all the things and it, and it, and it, it creates an unstable feeling. And I think that's what's causing part of the polarization. And I do think that the talks, especially in education about silver bullets like gosh if we could only do this the whole thing would be solved and if you know if, if we could just have charters take over the entire you know system we would all be in good shape um you know the truth of the matter are that there are nuances to all of that i believe charters play a very important role in our system i believe excellent charters play a very good role there are very bad charters too and there are charters that don't serve all kids you have a, you know the whole story but people come out and say gosh this is the apple pie and this is the thing and i think that just creates people want to fight with you when they're just like are you kidding me so you're saying that i'm then this and i'm not contributing positively and so i think I mean, personally, when I, was, I get questions that are like, well, are you pro-accountability or pro-whatever, pro-charter or pro-whatever? I'm pro-great schools for every child, and I think they, they come in different forms in public schools. Um, and I am pro-us ensuring that we are reflective and that we are being bold and courageous because I don't see a path forward in, like, not waking up in 20 years. I mean, our changing demographics of our nation are telling us the full story here. In California, I just read something a few months back that said of all the eighth graders, um, that over 50% of all public school students in eighth grade are Latino. Um, and 14% of them are proficient in math and 15% are proficient in reading. That is a disaster. I, I don't know what else to say. And I've said this in front of union. People were like, that is offensive that you say that's a disaster. I'm like, it is offensive that you say that is not a disaster. That is a disaster for our nation. And I do worry that in 20 years, that generation is going to wake up and sit around a table and say, what were these folks thinking? What did they do? Why did people wake up? This is a mess. Um, and it's not, and I say all that knowing people are working their tails off every day and doing really good work and really good people in our system. That is, I'm not saying that the people are the messed up ones. I'm saying we've really got to reflect on our systems that we have and ask ourselves, is what education was designed for 50 years ago serving our kids right now and preparing them to be educated for this global economy and and especially kids of color and kids growing up in low-income communities and so I think we've got to find common ground I think we've got to have hard conversations and you know it's it, you know I don't know if y'all are on social media but that is like I don't know the, the best way to be disrespectful and not thoughtful with each other and it, I don't know what to do about that I mean I I, I like stress out about any tweet that I write because I'm like, I'm going to get destroyed by saying this like this. Um, and, and we don't know each other and we're not talking to each other and we're not finding common ground. And I think that's not, that, I think that's destructive for us. And, and so that is my goal is to want to engage with people who have real questions and, and find the common ground. And I know we will not agree on everything. And I think that's okay. If we're trying to do what's best for kids every day, I think there's different ways to go at it. And as long as that's our goal, I think we can play in the same sandbox.
might work. Um, so what are you doing, what's TFA doing, and what can we do to start like opening up these national conversa conversations to try to decrease the polarization and like get people on the same page so we can make a change? I think we need to stop talking in binaries. I think we should refuse to engage in, in just those conversations. I was in a conversation a few months ago, and I went around the room, and, and I listened to people who were like, you know, um, I am a reformer, and I work in advocacy, but, but I don't want to be called a reformer because then I'm viewed as having this, like, you know, um, this, this agenda of wanting to privatize education. So this is where I stand. And then someone else went and was like, I think data is the devil. It is destroying our country and we need to stop doing it. And someone else went and said, you know, charters are the most horrific thing and I can't believe that we are adopting it and I can't believe Teach for America frankly places in charters and you know, whatever. And, and, and you just went around and you heard all of this and it's binaries, it's this or that when it's, or whatever. And then, and, then, and then I get asked, and so what are you? Are you for this or that or that? I'm like, you know what? I am not even, th that is the wrong question, people. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even going to engage that way with you. Um, I, I'm about figuring out great schools. I think we should be studying what is working, like in earnest, what great teachers, what are they doing that are like, you know, changing the trajectory of children? What are great schools doing? What are the, there are principles. We've learned this stuff. There are whole schools putting kids of color from low-income communities to and through college if that's what they want. There are, this is not like a thing we have to go figure out. There, this fact, in fact, exists. Like we don't have to, it's, no one can argue with us that it's not possible because it is. We have hundreds of examples. And rather than stepping back and saying, here's what's working about that, here's what's not, here are the conditions that are allowing this to be fueled, can we talk about, do we, what, what would be, have to be true for those things to, to happen more broadly so we can scale the impact and, you know, and stop doing things that are, are not working and be reflective and honest with ourselves about the things we've tried and hasn't worked and stop doing it. Like, you know, but, but for that, it requires real reflection. It does require having data and information that's used thoughtfully, that's not used against teachers. I mean, this whole craze on testing is it has been destructive in so many ways because um, I, I feel like we've been you know it, it's a punitive thing for teachers oh data you take a test and your teacher your students did this and so you're you're terrible and you're ostracized and people are publishing teachers names with their results I mean what have we come to that is horrific that anyone would think that is a sensible thing no data is incredible but it is one data point and it is a learning tool and we can learn so much and it's so empowering but that's not how we talk about it and so then it be then so then you know then you're on one side of the spectrum and I think that's what's happening in our country now so I just think nuances there are so many nuances to this and we've got to be smart about how we engage and, and refuse to just get in the swirl of things and and just I don't know get to the basics Hi there. Um, so you mentioned social media briefly, and it made me curious what your thoughts on digital tools in the classroom are. And um, online education is something yeah. we're hearing more and more about. And if you could speak to TSA's or TFA's, sorry, role. <laughs> TSA. Too many acronyms. <laughs> TFA's um, slip. relationship with online education. Yeah. Um, so I mean. Yeah, I mean, technology is, is the world we are living in. And I personally, um, I mean, I'm new to social media personally myself. And as I took on this role, my communications and public affairs team said, you have to get on Twitter at the very least. So I am on Twitter. Um, because this is the way people communicate these days. And it, it, I find it very challenging. Um, but this is the way of the world. Like I find even, you know, as the students who are graduating now from college and even my kids and this, the things they're, this, they don't understand other ways of interacting. I mean, this is just like the way and it's how people engage and are, you know, motivated. And so I think there's a very important role for um, technology in classrooms. 
Um, again, I think I get nervous when people are like, gosh, this is, this is the answer. You know, we need no more teachers. This is the way we're going to solve this problem. Um, there is no way, there's no one way we're going to solve this problem. And so I think there's lots of creative and incredible enrichments and supplemental things that you can do with technology and, and just real learning. I think about rural communities that are experimenting where they have a hard time finding teachers and, you know, having access to other great teachers across a state. Um, and can be taught through technology. I just think there's so much innovation ahead of us Excuse me. Um, on this front. And so I just, I'm excited and I think there's lots to learn about how that's going to really advance us um, in this quest. I think maybe one more question and Great. unless you want more, so. Okay. Hello. Um, Hi. So after seeing like some of the profound like results that Teacher America's had, individual classrooms and schools like kids learning two to three years of information in one year um, and other programs too like I Have a Dream Foundation or Public Achievement. Um, I'm curious what you think uh, the best way like to integrate these like best practices that we know work, um, where the push needs to come from in the educational system. Is it at the community, the county, the state, or even like the federal level and uh, how that would do that and then how we could get behind that. Yeah. Oh dear, that's a big question. Oh my. Um, so I guess what I would say, I mean, I think there are so many things, so it's hard to know, like, if I was, you know, in charge of the world and I could just put all the elements in place, like, what would I do? Um, I don't know, I'd have to really think about that. But I, I, I will say there are a few things that seem really important. Um, I think, first of all, and there's so much controversy about this, but I'll just state my clear belief on this. Um, there's so much, you know, talk about the common core, which are federal standards that are truly global standards that make every, that would, if, if achieved, would make, you know, our kids competitive for the world. And there is a push, and 44 states, in fact, have adopted um, the common core. But at the moment, it's a big idea. It hasn't been implemented. The best systems in the world have very clear standards as a nation. Um, and this way, there's no way to leave kids behind. Every kid matters. These are the standards. We work to accomplish this with kids. I, th I am scared about the direction of where that might go. Um, I don't know if you all are following. All the, contra all the controversy in New York, the Common Core assessments just came out, and they were, they were horrific results. Um, schools that were doing well in the eyes of parents and, and community, you know, plummeted. Um, I mean, like to, you would be scared if you were like, oh my gosh, this is my school, 20% proficiency. They were at 95% or 90% proficiency. Um, and that is freaking people out. And Tennessee went through this a few years ago because they've also moved on adopting the Common Core and actually are in execution mode. But that is scary. That's really, really scary. And I think, I hope that our nation will step up and say, this is the truth. I mean, it's hard and kids should not feel badly about themselves and neither should the teachers. But knowledge is power and I think truth is power. Don't lie to me, tell me the truth. I know the truth now. Now I feel like I can do something about it. Um, and so I really hope that, um, that we will stick with it. I th you know, parents in New York are going to be receiving their individual student scores in the coming weeks and I, I don't know what's gonna happen on that. So I, would, I, think, I think that is a really bold move in the right direction for our nation to have high standards for every kid and everyone be, be held accountable. And then I just think we've gotta do more to provide structures for teachers to thrive in their classrooms and for principals to have autonomy to run their schools as they see fit that are able to set the right goals, hire the teachers that they believe are best suited for their classrooms, pay the teachers what they believe they should be paid, um, have incentives to attract and retain the very best teachers on their campus and, and change the whole dialogue around the, how the profession of teaching is viewed in our nation, um, which I think is, is, is not the highest standard. I mean, that's what it has to become if we're going to really turn a corner and have the highest standards for everybody, teachers, principals, parents, ourselves, and, and figure out how we're going to do that. That would be my starting point. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.